talking about the judge. I mean, any of this, it's all basically in play tonight as we wait for Jesse Smollett to exit the Cook County Jail. His team is waiting by. Uh, of course, you will see it all happen right here on Closing Arguments uh, when that moment occurs. Uh, this was breaking news earlier tonight. It was a emergency appeal. Three judges voted two to one to let Jesse Smollett out. So what we're going to do, take a break as we wait for this to happen. When we come back, top of the hour, we'll take you back to Chicago so you can see and hear what happens as Jesse Smollett exits the Cook County Jail. Welcome to Closing Arguments. We have big breaking news tonight. Live pictures coming to us from Chicago, Illinois. The Cook County Jail, there it is. Uh, Jesse Smollett's uh, supporters, his team, members of his legal team, all situated uh, somewhere near the exit of the Cook County Jail. That's because earlier today, they won an emergency appeal to stay the jail sentence of Jesse Smollett. This is what the family's been waiting for. Obviously, what Jesse Small has been wanting is to get out of the Cook County Jail, and he will be out while his appeal gets heard, and we know how long that could take. Uh, folks, I have some people with us. You'll hear their voices uh, as we wait for this moment to happen. Eklund Mercy, criminal defense attorney, Atlanta, Georgia, staying with us. Nima Romani, former federal prosecutor. He's in L.A. tonight. Kirk Nurmi, uh, the attorney who represented Jody Arias, is also with us. You will also hear the voice of Erica Morse, a uh, private investigator who is actually in Chicago. Let me see those pictures a little larger. Is that Jesse Smollett coming out of? I think that's him in the middle, folks. Uh, that's, I, I believe that's him. That's got to be him. He has a mask on. Um, we expect that he may very well have something to say tonight on his way out of the jail. Will he talk about the alleged threats? Will he talk about how he was treated? Will he talk about his case? Um, all the questions that we're wondering that should be answered in just a moment, but this is just, this has to be him. I recognize that is Jesse Smollett walking out of the jail with his security team tonight. Let's listen. Jesse, do you have anything to say to the judge? Jesse, do you have anything to say to the judge? Ladies and gentlemen, was a quick, quick exit by Jesse Smollett. Eklund, you're laughing. Why are you laughing? Oh, because he is the best decision ever. Like, just go. He was the listening. Car. He was listening. <laughs> go to the car. Let, let, let me ask you, Kirk. Um, you've had a, a client or two in the past that you've gotten out of jail. Um, what is that moment like for them? What's on their mind? And I understand um, Jesse Smollett a little different than the rest, but is there a yearning to just get as far away from the jail as possible? I think so on many occasions, and especially someone like Mr. Smollett, who has an experience incarceration or long-term incarceration uh, before, like he experienced, you know, this past week. So I think, you know, he probably is tired. He's been frightened. He's been in a constant state of hypervigilance. He probably just wants to get away from it all. He he listened to Eklund. Maybe they've got closing arguments playing in the in the in the jail. I don't know. But he listened to Eklund. He listened to his attorneys. He got out of there and he's gonna collect himself. I don't necessarily know that this is the last we're gonna hear from him while this appeal is pending. He might uh, get his bearings and, and and do something else in the future. But for now, he made the right decision and he probably does need a little bit of space from all of it. Uh, Nima, I, I thought I saw members of his legal team there earlier. Um, they had indicated that they were going to speak. We didn't hear from them. We didn't hear from Jesse. Obviously, it could be a change of plans as all this is un unfolding. His security team was with him. 
Um, so give us a realistic look now. We're in the appellate process. Like months, yeah. years, what are we talking about? Uh, it's going to be months until the appellate briefs are filed, fully briefed. We're going to obviously hear oral argument. I mean, we know the issues. Some of them are moot now, you know, the COVID issue, the threat issue. But, you know, there are some other appellate issues, and you mentioned it. I mean, Kim Fox, the double jeopardy issue, it's probably their best one argument. One moment, right? one moment. Uh, I hate to interrupt you, Nima, but it looks like his attorneys are speaking. So let's listen in. This is Jesse Smollett's defense team speaking just moments after the release of their client from the Cook County Jail in Chicago. Does it sound okay or you want to hardwire us too? Which one? Uh, the bottom one. You want to hardwire it? Sounds like that. Looks like they're still setting things up here. So let's just wait one moment. I did see them as Jesse was going, but Jesse apparently just wanted to go home, but his attorneys will speak for him. That's why you hire an attorney, folks. We used to call them mouthpieces. Now we call him attorney. Check, 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 check. Yep. We're good here. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Attorney. There. I think they're still getting them mic'd up. They want to make sure their words are heard. Uh, but it's really a big day for this defense team. They went to the appellate court on an emergency basis to get Justin Smollett out. And a lot of times, that is three quarters of the battle, just getting your client okay. out of jail pending. Uh, obviously, the Smollett family, uh, they're very, very happy with today's developments. Uh, the legal team, Ms. Waddell, Mr. Allen, uh, Ms. Walker, and Ms. Lewis, and myself, we're very elated about this. Let me make something clear. There is no room for politics in our court system. And our appellate courts in this great state do not play politics. Let me make something clear. When this case was initially re-indicted, when this case was prosecuted, when this case was sentenced, at each of those steps, I wondered to myself whether Chicago has seceded from the union. Because in this country, in this country, you cannot punish a person twice. And while everyone was focused on the sensationalism surrounding this case, people were not focused on the constitutionality of the prosecution. And we've been trying to tell everyone that. It is unconstitutional to charge someone twice. Mr. Smollett paid a $10,000 fine. Let me repeat it again, because our appellate courts are listening. Paid a $10,000 fine and did community service. Now, there is no time machine to go back in time to undo those things. His $10,000 fine hasn't even been returned to him, right? And then you reindict the case and you give him 30 months probation for a class 4 felony with a man with no criminal record, felony record. 30 months probation, you give him 150 uh, days in jail, you give him what else? Uh, 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 you make him do... Um, uh, restitution of $120,000, and then you give him the maximum fines. You know, and, and there's something wrong with that. We've been complaining about the disparate treatment of African Americans in the judicial system, regardless of what you think about this case. Some people might think Mr. Smollett is guilty. I disagree. We all disagree. But that's okay. You're entitled to your opinion. But the real question is, should black men be walked into jail for a class four felony? Shame on you if you think they should. That's a disgrace. It's wrong. We're th talking about decarceration in this day and age. The Trump administration, the Obama administration, the Rauner administration in, in, in Illinois, and people are still trying to lock black men up, and it's a disgrace. Now, uh, the judge's sentencing, um, I couldn't disagree more with it. Uh, the judge spent a great deal of time chastising, berating my client. I've never seen that, and I thought it was unprofessional. That's my personal opinion. Not happy with that. And we look forward, now that this case is gone to the appellate court, to actually having, finally, an intellectual conversation about the constitutionality of this case. I'm not playing politics. That's all I'll say for now. Oh. How's everybody doing? Could you spell your sure. name Shay Allen is S-H-A-Y. And uh, it's no coincidence that we're here today. Um, I think we're here because the appellate court realized this was the right thing to do. I hope everyone realizes that the, the persecution that went on in that courthouse 
was absurd and that the sentence was a draconian sentence. It was excessive. And I, I've always called this case a class four murder. Apparently, this case was more important than the 20% cl clearance rate of the murders that are here in Chicago. Apparently, any citizen in Chicago, if they want to, if they don't like the decision that this duly elected official makes, can saunter into the courtroom and ask for a special prosecutor. I hope every citizen of Chicago realizes how important this case is, because this could be you. You may think, oh, that's ridiculous. I would never do these things that he's accused of. But you can definitely be charged for something you didn't do. You should never, ever be charged again for something that you had already been prosecuted for. It's important. Do not minimize it. It's not a joke. Thank you. It should also not be minimized. Heather, yes. Give your name and spell. Heather Waddell, W-I-D-E-L-L. -L. It should not be minimized, the issue of being tried in the court of public opinion and having to feel that you need to prove your own innocence. That goes against a major tenant of not just, obviously, Illinois, Cook County, but the United States judicial system. Mr. Smollett had to come into this courtroom two and a half years after, after this incident occurred and felt that he needed to prove his own innocence. And again, that's, that's patently unfair. That's not how the system works. It's not how the system should work. And the sentence that Judge Lynn doled out was completely devoid of any sort of intellectual curiosity or prowess. And I think, again, the appellate court, we're very, very lo much looking forward to having a political, non-political discourse with them that is um, intellectual, that's understanding of the laws, uh, that are understanding of what class four felonies mean, what the statutes are designed for by the legislature of the state. And again, moving forward, I hope that everyone understands, like Mr. Allen said, the very important nature of this case and the implications for every single citizen of this state and of this county, that anybody is capable of being charged with a crime. Anybody is being uh, is capable of being uh, charged with a felony and you are absolutely entitled to not say a word you're absolutely entitled to speak in your own defense and you're absolutely entitled uh, to representation uh, by attorneys so we're, we're very elated that mr smollett is out and we're the work is not uh, finished at this point yeah. hello tamara walker t-a-m-a-r-a -A. we are just pleased we are overjoyed that the appellate court was able to cut through the politics, to cut through the smoke screen, and was able to understand that we have real, definitive issues for appeal. And that's why they made the decision that they made. This is a very serious issue that any American can lose their presumption of innocence should be an affront to us all. And you all saw during the sentencing how Judge Lynn took it upon himself to not only sentence our client, which is his right as a judge, but to character assassinate him. Let's not forget that the least act of a man is not the measure of a man. And we had letters of support from the NAACP who talked about the disparate treatment that black males receive in the criminal justice system. It is time to have that conversation. And we are elated that the appellate court is able to decipher the legal issues here and apply the correct standard. And we look forward to this process playing out. Thank you. Uh, questions? N or Nenye or, yes. or whoever spoke with Jussie this evening to inform him he was getting out yes. of jail. Tell us about that phone call. What was his reaction? Uh, I, the first thing Jussie did was he, you know, the what separates us in the jail because of COVID is the glass. And he pushed his hands on the glass and he was, his eyes got teary. And I've never seen that because he's been very strong in there. And he said... I nearly lost hope in our constitutional system. And he did say that. He did say that. And, um, and it, that was his reaction. He was shocked. I think he had nearly given up. I, I can't speak for him. You would have to ask him that question. But just looking at him, a human to another human, put in a cage for a class four felony. Shame. You know? So, so I hope the media would actually, instead of leaving here today and reporting about how he walked out and what, report on the constitutionality. Should the press, the number one defenders of the constitution, the fourth arm of government, should you be standing by reporting on how, oh, I think this is crazy, Jussie did this, maybe he did this, as opposed to standing there and asking yourselves in your newsroom, is this right? Could this happen to any one of us? Exactly. 
Could someone come by and say, hey, listen, listen, guys, I grew up in Nigeria under military rule. It's dangerous. We're playing with fire. The idea that a person can be charged twice, report that. Talk about that. The appellate court took a look at our motions. We submitted it to them. Focus. Stop focusing on sensational stuff. This, these are not tabloid papers. Focus on the real stuff. Is it right for a person to be punished twice? You know? And I'm going to say, is it is he getting all this attention because he accused two white men, or, or according to the media reports, is it because somehow the accusations were about, um, Jussie said it was a white guy? Is that what's really going on? Because multiple reports, false reports, are made against black men all, all over the country. Nobody cares. They're under-prosecuted, non-prosecuted. Nobody cares. Why is it this one? What's really going on? Why are people so charged about it? Right? This is ridiculous. And you guys have to start doing your jobs. I've said it before, my father had a Fulbright scholarship in, the, in journalism. He was a professor of journalism. Do your job. Get out there, ask the right questions. I'm tired of reading the papers and reading tabloid stuff. Talk about the constitution, ask the question, should he be charged a second time? I mean, it's frustrating. We've been through year, a year and a half of nonsense. And it has to stop, guys, please. Focus on the Constitution. Focus on whether this is right. Any other questions? Sorry, it's been, it's been long. When is your next court date? What's the next legal step? Well, of course, we are going to... Um, right now, he's out. Uh, we're waiting for further ruling from the appellate court, and we're going to, of course, begin a normal appeal. Right? What we did initially was an emergency appeal, and now we're going to start the will for a regular appeal and they release the schedule once I make that application. So that's coming soon. Good question. Could you talk about the timing of this and how getting Sorry. getting him out of jail because the appeal process is so long and he would have easily spent his sentence. Isn't that scary? Isn't that scary? Isn't that scary? Shouldn't that be frightening to everyone? Because tomorrow could be anyone's family member. Um, it, it's It was really... If I'm understanding your question right, it was it was a scary moment for us. And even a day spent in jail is scary. He's been here for how long? Six days? That's scary. Right? That's scary. And he hasn't eaten. Guys, he hasn't eaten for six days. Why? Maybe he knew spiritually something we didn't know, right? So he hasn't eaten for six days. Why? Well, I'm sorry? Why hasn't he eaten? I'm gonna find out from him. But maybe being in a cage for a class four is enough to make you not to eat. I wouldn't eat either. I'll be upset. Danielle, what is your relationship? So hold on, child. I just so. wanted to ask, he, he left very quickly. He didn't answer any questions or make any comments. Where is he going? Where is he going to spend his time here? Come on now, <laughs> Charlie. Uh, what, what does Jesse relate to you about his time in six days at Kirkwood County? Um, I, you know, he's been really, really strong. Um, each time, we've all seen him every day. And each time we've gone in there, he's been very strong. You know, honestly, I, you know, I expected, you know, going in there, most clients I see in custody, they're usually broken, but he wasn't broken. He isn't broken either. And um, he's a very strong leader type personality. And he held, he held up in there. He held up in there, you know? Is, uh, I'm sorry, is he allowed to leave the state? I mean, you don't want to tell us where he's going, but is he allowed? Question. Is he staying in Chicago? I'm not going to ask that. Well, just wait. He's going, I'm sure somebody from the family is going to talk but soon. legally, has it been said that he can leave the state or not? Well, yes. When the judge gave him probation, he allowed him to travel and stuff, right? So so the answer to, to that question is an absolute yes. So he has not eaten or he's eaten very little? No, or, no. He's or? been drinking ice cold water. Ice water. That's been his food and liquid. Is this a protest? Is this, uh, what's the... Charlie, if you were in jail for something you didn't do, what, I mean, would you eat or would you be... Pro I don't know. No, I mean, asking, yeah, no, I know, Charlie. I, I, I don't know. I, and I really don't know. And I'm going to get you those answers. I'm sure Jesse, someone from his family at some point will make a statement. But, but I don't know. But I can only imagine if I was in jail for something I didn't do, or I thought I was in jail and the sentence was too harsh, I doubt I'll be eating. I, I think food is the last thing I'll be thinking about. Any other questions and we're done? Okay. All right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, all right, folks. All this talk about eating. We got a lot to chew on tonight. So um, we're going to take a quick break. When we, They're always quick. When we come back, we'll bring back in our think tank. We also have 
Uh, Erica Morse with us. She's in Chicago. Uh, a lot to talk about. He brought up some great issues. Some things I agree with, some things I disagree with. But we're going to talk about it all. Was, was he sentenced to jail because he's black? Was this a case of double jeopardy? Is there a constitutional argument here? We'll break it all down when we return. Folks, this happened just moments ago. Jesse Freeze. Smollett. Can you tell us what the past week has been like? Leaving the Cook County Jail, not answering Jesse, any questions, quickly getting into his SUV with security and heading home. He's out of jail tonight. An emergency appeal won by his uh, legal team. They just spoke. They indicated he hasn't eaten in six days. Um, but in that press conference that his legal team had, they brought up a lot of issues. You know, took a shot at the press, the way the story's been covered in the papers uh, in Chicago and around the country. Uh, there's a lot of things, and they made some points that I agreed with, some that I disagreed with. But let's talk about it all. We've got a great, great panel with us. It's like our supersized think tank tonight in our second hour. Eklund Mercy is with us, criminal defense attorney in Atlanta, Georgia. Nima Romani, former federal prosecutor, is in Los Angeles. Kirk Nurmi in Phoenix, Arizona, uh, the attorney who represented Jody Arias, uh, author of Trapped with Ms. Arias, and Erica Morse, who's a private investigator in Chicago. So um, she's one of the victims of Smollett's case, Eklund, just so you know, because it was the city of Chicago that was the victim in all of this. All right, there's a bunch of things that I'm going to hit all of you with different types of questions to address everything that was addressed by the defense team. Eklund Mercy, I'll start with you. Jesse Smollett was sentenced to jail because he's black? That's what they were saying. Really? Do we believe that? Or is that, or are they trying to do something here? Yes, because he got left, he got more time than insurrections. And that's what they're doing. Oh, so let me tell you, being a black No, no, he didn't get more time. Right now, I know you're bringing it back finish, to January 6th. Let, let me There are people, no, 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 wait, 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 wait. I didn't, I There are people in thought. jail. I gotta finish the thought. Okay. And what I'm trying to tell you is, is that as a black attorney practicing in these times and you are seeing different cases and your particular case is is feeling like, hey, they're just making him an example. Yes, the only thing that is different from him is it, like you have to consider it. Systematic racism is real and it happens often. What he was trying to tell them is like they didn't even consider the double jeopardy argument initially. And it's frustrating. So he has to fight the, the, the case in the um, court of public opinion. He has to fight the case in the actual court. And you also have to fight the case and prepare for appeal. It gets frustrating. You know, and it's not because he's he's a black man in Chicago. And he did bring up a great point because nobody can tell him why the judge went so hard. So they had to go on their necks. And I am here for all of it because initially he told you he paid the fine. He did. He paid the fine. He did a community service case closing. You came right. back. We're going to get we're going to get to that. We're going to get to that. I'm going to break them down one at a time. All the issues here. Erica Morris, I want to go to you on this because you're in Chicago. And one of the things that his attorney was saying, um, this could happen to any one of us. And I was thinking about it a couple different ways. And, and, and I want to reference what Eklund just said, which was originally after he was indicted, the charges were just like, poof, they went away. They were dismissed. And there was no, he, he did some vague community service that we don't even know about and a $10,000 fine. I mean, would that happen to anyone who, who was indicted in Chicago? Do, does the prosecutor just kind of like poof in the, in the middle of the day, just dismiss cases without a guilty plea in a courtroom? Nah. Um, and that's why I'm going to tell you tonight, Vinny, why the people I've talked to and, and me, um, we're upset with the state's attorney on this one. Because if you followed not only her behavior from the beginning, then this almost what feels like a secretive plea deal, and then this abhorrent op-ed 
that she penned calling this entire trial mob justice against Jesse Smollett is just disgusting. Um, the people that I've talked to and I myself fully feel that she would have made a great defense attorney for Jesse Smollett, but not representing the citizens of Cook County, certainly not representing CPD, and definitely not representing every family of every victim who, who suffered as a result of all these wasted resources while, while Jesse Smollett was out perpetrating this hoax. And I'm gonna say something else. Don't go about the, the court of public opinion. Um, I've been a reporter for 30 years and what an insult to tell us how to do our jobs. But talk about the court of public opinion and him not getting a fair trial. I firmly remember Jesse running up to the cameras, talking to the cameras and using the court of public opinion to sell this story and this hoax in the first place. I'm, I'm ticked tonight. I'm ticked. <laughs> now, let's get to the big legal argument, the constitutional argument. And, and, I'll, and I'll start with you, Nima Romani, because you're a former federal prosecutor. Double jeopardy is, is a real thing, right? You can't be prosecuted twice for the same crime. So was this initial indictment and dismissal a prosecution or not? Because they're claiming that he was... He was punished for it with a $10,000 fine and some community service. I don't remember him being in a courtroom pleading guilty. I just know that the indictment was dismissed. So is that an actual prosecution, which would then bar under our constitution, a second prosecution? Finney, it's a very good legal argument. And we've talked about some terrible ones like COVID, the threats, but absolutely, he forfeited that bail. And I agree with Erica, Kim Fox completely, not only dropped the ball here, she sabotaged special prosecutor Dan Webb's case. So if the appellate court based its decision on double jeopardy and not the other things that we've been talking about for the past hour and a half, I think Smollett has a good chance of getting this conviction overturned. And you know, what Fox did in this case, what the prosecutor did in the Cosby case to really tank that case. And obviously we're talking about two very difficult, uh, different sides of the political spectrum, but really you do have prosecutors acting as defense attorneys. You know, exactly what Erica said. We have one in Chicago and we have one in my hometown of Los Angeles. So with prosecutors like this, who needs defense attorneys? Yeah, Kirk, your thoughts about the double jeopardy? Cause that's, that's serious, that's super serious. That is our Constitution, says you cannot be prosecuted twice for the same crime. Yeah, I agree with exactly what Nima said. I mean, if this was dismissed, whether it goes in the court of law and pleads to it or not, there's all kinds of diversion programs across the nation, et cetera, that, that crimes like this, this lower level, keep in mind we're talking about a class four felony, what would be a misdemeanor in a lot of state. And he, if he paid a, a price, meaning a monetary price, he did community service, what have you, and that was satisfactory to the prosecuting authorities. To me, that's game over. I don't even understand why we're here because that jeopardy does attach at that point that he pays a punishment for it. If it was just contemplated and he didn't pay the price, maybe the water would be a little more muddy. But to me, this seems very clear, Vinny. There was a choice to prosecute. There was some sort of diversion, whatever anybody wants to think of the justice of that diversion, that is what the prosecutor chose. And that's what the prosecutors have the discretion to do. It's not acting like a defense attorney. Prosecutors have broad discretion. So she, Miss Fox, exercised that discretion, saw this case was what it was for, probably didn't want to invoke fear on people reporting hate crimes in the future in the streets of Chicago as what resulted when this sentence was delivered, not to mention the 45 minute diatribe attacking Mr. Smollett's character. So yes, I think this is a very good argument. And ultimately, I agree with Nima, if this is the grounds that the Court of Appeals overturns his conviction, they will be well suited to do so. All right, Eklund, we only have like 20 seconds, but I want to get you in on the legal uh, double jeopardy argument as well. Yeah, well, as a defense attorney, we have this all the time. Certain things get indicted. I say, hey, you know, my client had some issues. Let's just, um, you know, uh, and we have deals with the prosecutor. You do some community service. I'll talk to you later. You know, you do some community service, you pay a fine, then we'll drop the indictment. Like, it happens so often, and it's like a handshake. It's it's there. It's an order. It's null process. It's dismissed. You can go. And then after 
doing that to um, save money, you know, to save in the interest of judicial economy, it happens often. And then to come back and then just reel him and then ch- like, it, it, it's wrong. It's wrong. I do agree with Kirk. And I, I, I believe that, I, boy, I couldn't see. It's wrong. And I, and I do, I agree with Kirk. And I believe that um, the defense attorneys were right in this case. We shall see. They'll have a shot with the appellate court. Big thank you, everyone, tonight. Eklund, Nima, Kirk, and, of course, Erica Morse. Uh, thank you. Whew, what a night. Still ahead.